Congressman, great to have you on the show today, sir. Well, thank you, John. It's great to be with you this afternoon. It's an amazing time. I, I remember exactly a year ago this day, I was sitting in front of the computer writing breaking news alerts about the horrific frenzied airport exodus in Kabul, the sort of the end of the bungled Biden exit from Afghanistan. And I wonder a year later, your thoughts. I mean, you served our country in the military and really concerned about where Afghanistan has gone since we left. A year later, are we safer or less safer after that withdrawal? Oh, no. Um, John, we are definitely less safe after that uh, uh, horrendous withdrawal, that botched withdrawal. Um, Biden has shown uh, to the entire world his failed leadership, uh, his failed military leadership, and and, uh, Afghanistan uh, is a big black eye for the United States. You know, I I served three combat tours in Iraq and Kuwait, uh, and, um, you know, one of those was in direct support uh, of the operations in Afghanistan, and and, uh, it just broke my heart when I saw what happened. I mean, the way that the president, um, you know, just abandoned Bagram Air Base, which was really the key to maintaining stability within that region right there. I mean, we had Bagram Air Base. Uh, It was such an incredible base that was built there and the prison that was then left wide open and, and, you know, 5,000 terrorists then went out into the, into the night. And um, uh, that was just such a travesty. Um, We, it did not have to be that way. Uh, President Biden bears full responsibility for it. And here we are a year later uh, with the Taliban in total control of Afghanistan and with them just just beating the drum now about potential new attacks. And uh, and, and this is um, this is uh, uh, this is just terrible. And, you know, when we take back the House in in January, and I firmly believe that Republicans will, uh, we are going to give this a proper investigation because no one has been held accountable here, John. No one has been held accountable, and they need to be. You know, from from the the State Department to the Department of Defense, um, this has has just been a disaster for America on the world stage. And and you see the results of that um, with Ukraine and and potentially Taiwan too. Yeah, there's no no doubt about it. And I think the whole world was shaken by the fact that America could exit so messily, so in disregard of the security protocols. You've probably seen the testimony now. It hasn't got a lot of attention in the news media, but when you see what the former commander of U.S. Central Command, CENTCOM, General Kenneth McKenzie, when he testified, I told the president I thought we should have 2,500 troops behind and that we should hold Bagram. The implicit acknowledgement is that the president rejected his best military advice on this. That hasn't gotten the attention I think a lot of people think it deserves. What does it say when a president doesn't listen to his own commanders, the experts on the ground in Afghanistan? Well, it it says that the president thinks he knows best. Uh, He's obviously a man of no military experience. And, uh, you know, President Trump, though he may not have military experience either, he has business experience and, and he knows what it takes to run an incredible organization. And you listen to those who are under you who are experts in their particular area. You hire people that are, quote, you know, smarter than yourself. Um, and, and you bring those together through incredible leadership and you build that sort of a team. I mean, President Trump had a conditions based withdrawal plan. Uh, and when the Taliban violated those conditions, he hammered them. Joe Biden's withdrawal plan was based on a date. He wanted to be out of there, you know, by the 31st of August so we could celebrate being out of there and on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And it simply would never work. It will never work when you have a date that you have to be gone by and it, and it doesn't matter what kind of pain is inflicted on you, that never works militarily. As we saw, it was a debacle, it was a disaster. We lost 13 uh, incredible members of our military because of it, died in a terrorist attack that that could easily have been prevented if we had held Bagram. I mean, it just, it, it, it's insanity what we saw happen over there. And, um, and as I said, President Biden bears full and total responsibility for that debacle of a, um, of a retreat. 
Yeah, I'm just going to read this line because it, it's six in my mind. I remember the day he gave it back in March. Unfortunately, we were focused on other things back in March. And so the news media didn't cover this for the extraordinary moment. But this is General McKenzie's exact quotes. In the spring of 2021, that's when Joe Biden was in, uh, in charge now, it was a mistake to go below of 2,500 troops. If, in fact, we did so, we expected the government of Afghanistan to collapse. That reflected my opinion and the opinion of General Miller, his deputy, and we, who was in Afghanistan. We had an opportunity to freely express that opinion. I'm confident it was heard, but it was rejected. Really remarkable testimony. You served. You know what it takes. You, you, you had a company that grew into an important armory company. There were 20 years of bloodshed in this country. How do veterans, how do people who gave all or gave so much to fight that war to make sure it wouldn't become a terrorist haven. Think now when they look out and realize, well, Alzwari was sitting on a deck so comfortable in Afghanistan, he thought he was free. Have those who have served feel the pain of the fact that that's back to being a terrorist haven again? Uh, you, you know, that does have to be incredibly disappointing and, um, and, and tragic for people who, especially those who lost loved ones over there, but they just have to be comforted in knowing that for 20 years, we have, their sacrifices have protected Americans on this side of the globe. And uh, so their sacrifices are not lost. They were not for nothing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's back to, to where it was before, but uh, we have learned a lot more about that region. And um, uh, so I would say that their service is still, there's no different in the honor of their service now um, than it was before. It's just that we're, we're just going to have to, um, you know, make our shield stronger and, um, and we're going to have to fight more now. I think we're in a less safe place, like what you said uh, earlier, uh, than we were uh, when we had troops on the ground in Afghanistan being able to control that or help, con help the government control that country. So, um, uh, you know, their service was incredibly honorable to our country and it did preserve our liberty for years. Uh, there's no doubt. We were safer because of all those sacrifices. There was a report earlier this week that some of the elite Afghan fighters after the collapse of the government, when it was clear Taliban was in charge, they fled with their equipment to Iran. I just think about that right now. Iran has not only the soldiers we trained in Afghanistan, but some of the equipment. And meanwhile, they're talking about and plotting to kill people on our own soil. President George W. Bush, John Bolton, the two most recent examples. Why are we negotiating with Iran, given the bad record that we're seeing with their behavior in the world? Well, you know, that example you gave just shows the extent of the disaster of the retreat out of Afghanistan when the 80 plus billion dollars worth of equipment that we left behind uh, for the Taliban or excuse me, uh, for the, the, the Afghan government that was then just turned right on over to the Taliban, uh, forfeited to the Taliban. Um, and then to to have any negotiations with Iran, um, it, it just shows the lack of leadership on the world stage. I mean, Obama was doing it during his tenure. But President Trump was strong during his uh, uh, time in the, in the Oval Office. Uh, when you negotiate with terrorists and you do it from a position of weakness, you are going to lose. And that's exactly what we're going to see. And we're not going to get any sort of a good deal in negotiating with Iran from a position of weakness. You have to show strength. They have to respect you. Right now, I don't believe they do respect us. Uh, there's other countries in the world that don't respect us uh, simply because we have shown uh, tremendous weakness on the world stage. Um, it really is remarkable. Another place where we're seeing a lot of weakness right now, the economy. You're a small business owner. You know what happens when government gets in the way of business. You take a look at the law that they call the Inflation Reduction Act, even though the CBO is clear that it doesn't have any impact downward. It doesn't put inflation downward. And there are some estimates it brings it upward. We're already in a tough economy. What happens over the next six months when we pour that $700 billion into the economy? Oh, I mean, the, the title of the, of the bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, is just a flat out lie uh, to the American people. It should be called the Inflation Expansion Act or the Inflation Inflation Act. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> That's what it's going to do. When you inject $740 billion, almost 
three quarters of a trillion dollars into the economy, you're going to increase inflation. That's just the way economics 101 works. I mean, uh, the Democrats obviously don't understand economics. Uh, I don't. I, I wonder that they understand math. They certainly don't understand how to define a woman. So um, you got to wonder where their heads are in this particular bill. Uh, I think it was a smokescreen uh, for their Green New Deal. Uh, as Nancy Pelosi said, um, you know, how can people vote against Mother Earth? Well, they're not talking about inflation reduction anymore. Once the, the Senate passed the bill and the House passed the bill on a party line vote basis, not one solitary Republican voted for this. It is a disaster of a bill. They are leading us down the wrong path. Uh, so we are going to see, in my opinion, inflation continue to increase. It's going to continue to take a bites out of, uh, out of people's earnings every year. And, and you know, where, where the administration said that last month uh, we had 0% inflation, and yet we know it was 8.5%. I mean, if it was 0%, why did we even need this bill, the Inflation Reduction Act? I mean, that just goes to show you uh, the deceitfulness of the title of the bill. Um, so, and then probably the worst aspect of this bill is the increase in the IRS. Literally $80 billion to the Internal Revenue Service over 10 years, where their annual budget is only $12 billion. Six times their annual budget, they will be getting in additional funds to hire additional enforcement agents and who do you think they're going to going to go after, John? You think they're going to go after the Democrat donors the, or, or the, the high income earners that have uh, an army of tax accountants and that don't even do their own taxes? No, they're going to come after you and me. Those folks in the middle class or in the lower class that don't have the ability to fight against the IRS, that basically just fold because, you know, if whatever the IRS says extra that you owe, it's not worth it fighting because you're going to spend more money fighting the IRS than what they're requiring of you. So they're just going to milk the middle class uh, and um, and it's it's going to be devastating economically for our country. It really is remarkable. And, and we had some accounting firms on who they said, you know, when, when someone gets an audit notice, if you're a mom and pa fisher or, you know, Joe working at the factory and you get a notice, you're automatically going to spend between three and $5,000 to just address the audit. And most people fold their hands and pay whatever the IRS says because it's not worth the extra time away. So that's an additional penny. Three to $5,000 is the average, according to the accounting firm. And we went and grabbed this data from a very respected university data tracking center. It's called Transactional Records Clearinghouse out at Syracuse University. They looked at the last two years of IRS enforcement. 61% of all audits occurred with people under the income level of $25,000 because they've been auditing people who get the earned income child tax credit. We're focusing on people who have the least amount of money to give back. How did this system get so out of whack? Well, it just goes to show you how the Internal Revenue Service can be manipulated and can be used to as a weapon against whatever the enemy of the political establishment happens to be, whoever that enemy is. I mean, for me, I wish it would have only cost me three to $5,000 in my dealings with the IRS. But back in 2013, in order for me to win my case against the IRS, it cost over $150,000, John. I mean, so, so mind you, we were dealing with a whole lot more money. They came against business, all right, through civil asset forfeiture. But this is a weaponization of the Internal Revenue Service, and um, and this is 100% on Democrats who want this, who want to increase their ability to threaten and coerce and intimidate uh, conservatives. And the vast majority of them are going to be those who make under $200,000, in fact, actually under $75,000. And uh, that's your average hardworking American citizen. And um, we need to stop this and, and we need to do it by, um, by making our voices loud and clear in November and throwing out the current leadership so we can, we can reverse this issue, we can reverse this policy. And uh, in fact, honestly, John, we, what we really need to do is eliminate the Internal Revenue Service. 
That would be the solution. HR 25, the Fair Tax Act, I think is the right way to go here. I'm hoping that this, that what has happened, that this bill now, the uh, um, the Inflation Expansion Act, will give us the the motivation and the the energy to pass this particular bill and to completely eliminate the Internal Revenue Service. And that bill would then eliminate the tax return from every citizen's life. And we would be so much better as a country for it. The flat tax, fair tax sort of came up about a decade ago. It had a lot of synergy for a while. Then it kind of faded a little bit. Seems like that is catching fancy with members of Congress. Are your colleagues in the House beginning to talk that, hey, maybe that's a great way to go back, get rid of the big bureaucracy. Everybody knows what they pay out the door and we're done. Is that picking up some steam? It is. It is picking up some steam. I'm excited about that fact uh, because I want to see the IRS terminated. It is an agency that has uh, outlived its usefulness, in my opinion. Uh, I think we can go to a better tax system, uh, a more fair tax system across the uh, across the United States. And and then it eliminates the weaponization of the IRS. And that's exactly what we're going to see with these 87,000 new agents that are going to be onboarded into the IRS. And uh, I think that, that we will see, um, you know, this being talked about more and more. In fact, I'm hoping that, that maybe we will uh, be able to do a discharge petition on the House floor. Maybe we'll be able to lead that and uh, bring, the, bring the fair tax up for a vote. Yeah, I think that is such an important dynamic. And it's so funny to see it catch fire again, because it was an idea that uh, had some momentum for a while. It's definitely back in vogue. It's going to be very interesting to see. All right. The last part of this Inflation Reduction Act. Well, everybody says this is a big green economy. The transformative, uh, if you listen to Democrats, the transformative moment in American history, where we're going to get to a green energy economy. I heard this promise once before in 09 when they did the shovel ready package for America, which, by the way, another project for shovel ready gave us Solyndra. But there's a number in here that drives me nuts because there's no explanation how they're going to get there. It just says flatly in seven years, we're going to cut U.S. carbon emissions by 40 percent. Do any of your colleagues in Congress have any data from the administration how they're going to get to that extraordinary number in seven years? No, I don't think so whatsoever. That's a pipe dream, in my opinion. I, I mean, to think that we're all going to transition to electric vehicles, I mean, that's simple insanity. That is, that is their, their utopia, and that is not going to happen. Uh, you, the electric vehicles aren't there, for one thing. In fact, I think, you know, having electric vehicles in certain places, maybe metropolitan areas, and, and, uh, but long haul with electric vehicles, no. Uh, that's just not an option, and I don't think it'll be an option in your lifetime or my lifetime. Fossil fuel is here to stay, and it's here to stay for a very long time. The United States has over is estimated at current rates at over 400 years worth of supply of fossil fuels, and that is what, where our focus needs to be. Green energy is not reliable. Wind is not reliable. Solar is not reliable. But fossil fuel and nuclear are incredibly reliable. And that's what we need. That's where our focus needs to be. That's where um, Americans need to, to, you know, that's what needs to drive our economy. And there's so many ways to use fossil fuels and, and still bring down emissions. It isn't like Republicans want to pollute, right? You keep getting this. The Democrats have this false narrative they use. Well, Republicans don't care about the uh, green economy. They don't care about the climate. Actually, most Republicans have given us the most famous climate legislations in history. You've got the park system with Teddy Roosevelt. You've got Reagan's famous Montreal Protocol deal that got rid of fluorocarbons. And you got uh, Donald Trump and the Republican Congress passing one of the largest conservation laws in the world. You guys care about it, but you keep getting blamed. How does that dynamic change? How do you turn this around on Democrats and say, they spent a lot of money, got us nothing. We spent you know, generous amount of money, and we got a lot of effect for our Republican policies. When does that debate change, you think? Well, and, and then you look at where this money is going. I mean, the vast majority of, the, of this Green New Deal money is going to China. To China, who makes the solar panels, who makes the wind turbines, who makes that sort of stuff. You know, and but how do they make it with coal, with fossil fuel? I mean, if 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 we're concerned about, you know, global climate change, 
then we should be concerned about what China is putting into the air when it comes to emissions. And we don't, we're not, you know, we're not going to, we are not the entire world here in the United States. We're only a very small portion of it. And, um, and our, we can cut our emissions to a, a, totally a hundred percent. And it's hardly going to move the needle at all in the world when you have other countries like China and They'll India. They'll just take up the excess and beat us at it. Yeah. I mean, you know, Russia, whatever. I mean, Russian national gas is, or, or Russian natural gas is, um, is tremendously more dirty than U.S. natural gas. So uh, it just doesn't make sense what, where they're going, but that's just normal. You know, that's a protocol for Democrats. I've never found them to really make sense. Nope, they have an echo chamber in the media. And over time, I think people will, will begin to absorb it. I think they know now. There's a moment in your state that I think is going to be critical. Obviously, the Senate race is a big deal. you got the incumbent against Herschel Walker. So you got a Democrat who's trying to hold on in a purple state. And in this bill, there was this tax credit for EV vehicles. And as soon as it came out, it was learned that Kia, one of the largest employers in all of Georgia, I think 4,000 employers, they're not going to be able to take advantage of this tax credit because of the way it was written. It actually nullifies their ability to be eligible or have their cars eligible for it. That seems like that's going to hit really hard the Georgia everyday voter. How big a mistake was this for the Democrats? Well, I think, you know, this tax credit for electric vehicles is a mistake across the board because what we are doing is we are incentivizing specific industries. We are choosing winners and losers. And that's not what the government is here to do. That's not what our capitalistic system is designed for. We are not in the government here to pick winners and losers. We are here to to make it fair Okay, our regulations fair uh, for people to to innovate and to um, bring their exceptional ideas and bring them to market and through hard work to profit from it. But um, but that's not what government is doing here. When you incentivize specific things and then and and overly and tax other things, then you're picking winners and losers, and that's wrong. That is not good for Georgia. It's not good for our country, and that's another problem with this bill. Yeah, I'm really jaw-dropping. Last question, because I know you're real busy, but you're on the oversight committee. You play an important role in, in creating accountability in Congress. FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago. A lot of questions that I assume that you and your colleagues are going to want to get answered probably in January, because it doesn't seem like the DOJ is going to answer anything before then. Is this going to be one of the many focuses that your great committee will be focused on? Uh, I think it will be a focus of both the oversight committee and the judiciary committee. Uh, I believe we are going to dissect the FBI and the Department of Justice, and we are going to put them under a microscope piece by piece, and we are going to see uh, where the corruption lies, not if there is corruption, but where the corruption lies, and we are going to expose it because it is very evident through this uh, raid on President Trump's residence, his home, that, um, uh, that the FBI and the DOJ have been weaponized. And they are trying to do anything and everything, in my opinion, to um, uh, disqualify President Trump from running for office again in 2024. Um, and they are going to lose. I think that um, the American people see right through this. I think that's one of the reasons why that they don't want the affidavit released. They don't want the American public to know the real reason behind this raid. And um, uh, it's unconscionable. And we need to um, hold the FBI and the DOJ accountable. And honestly, where we need to impeach folks for violating the law, we need to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, sir, what an honor to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. We covered a lot of ground. I also want to thank you for your service. A lot of people don't know this. 28 years in the Navy, three combat tours. Your country owes you a great debt of gratitude. We want to thank you for your time today. John, great to be with you. Thank you. You as well, sir. 